Hello and welcome to the latest Flood Modeler webinar. It's great to see so many people joining us from around the world. Uh, my name is Alistair Shepherd and I'll be hosting the webinar, which is going to be delivered by Bob Potter, who is the development manager for Flood Modeler software at Jacobs. So we're really excited to be able to introduce some of the latest features within the next generation of Flood Modeler version five. Um, and the latest update will be going live on our website in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we hope today's presentation will provide uh, a nice introduction to what's possible uh, within the software going forward. Um, before we do make a start, I'll cover uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so, today, so today's webinar is uh, slightly longer than usual uh, and will last approximately one hour. We have allocated a chunk of time at the end for questions as we've already received quite a few in advance at the, uh, the registration process. Uh, as today's session is a special webinar, uh, we also have uh, a panel panel of flood modeler experts to help answer your questions at the end. If you wanted to ask a question uh, during the webinar, we ask that you submit these using the chat facility, which can be found in the GoToWebinar console. Uh, and the webinar is also being recorded um, and will be uploaded to our website later this week uh, if you wanted to rewatch or, or share it with colleagues. Finally, we have a number of other webinars lined up which form part of the Flood Modeler 5 series, all of which can be viewed and registered for on our website at floodmodeler.com forward slash webinars. So that's the, the housekeeping out of the way. Let's let's make a start. Um, so today's webinar uh, will introduce a number of key features which are going to be available within version 5. Bob will provide a number of live demonstrations. Uh, he will also cover a few of the other enhancements made to, to Flood Modeler 5. We're going to briefly touch on some of the other things that are already in development and will be provided within future releases of the software, uh, next one being early next year. And then we'll finish up with the, the Q&A session at the end. Um, so I'll now hand over to Bob. Um, as we are limited on time, uh, we've decided to focus on three key areas or, or features. Um, and these include the new one the Urban Solver, uh, which for the first time enables you to undertake integrated catchment modeling uh, and model surface and subsurface flows directly within the flood modeler interface. Uh, new embedded structures, uh, which allow you to embed 1D structures within the 2D domain uh, in just a few simple steps. And finally, the new levy markers uh, that are now available within 1D river sections, and these enable you to realistically represent water levels for an entire section. Uh, as it says at the bottom of the slide, version 5 does provide uh, over 30 other enhancements, which will be detailed within the, the release notes uh, and also at the upcoming webinars over the next couple of weeks. So with that, uh, I will now hand you over to Bob to introduce the first feature. Thanks very much, Alistair, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be able to have this opportunity to talk to you about uh, Flood Modeler version 5. We've put a lot of hard work in, and hopefully I'll be able to show you some exciting new features in the presentation today. And so to start with, I want to cover the new 1D Urban Solver. So first of all, really to set, to set the scene, I want to um, give you a little bit of background as to why we've implemented this feature. So we understand that, obviously, that uh, pipe and drainage networks can have a significant impact on the uh, urban flood zone and therefore they really have they have to be taken account of in any of our, any sort of um, modeling in this um, urban area um, in the past this has had to be undertaken using a comp combination of our 1d river solvers and 2d solvers and to make uh, a, an accurate representation that incorporates the um, pipe drainage, drainage networks into the, such a model is a complex procedure. So to try and make that process a lot easier and a lot more um, accurate, we've uh, introduced a new 1D urban solver within Flood Modeler. And you can integrate this within a um, uh, urban, uh, into, within a um, integrated catchment model that incorporates both the 1D urban solver and, uh, and any of our existing 1D river and 2D solvers. So what exactly have, uh, are the features we've added for version 5? So just to give a, a little bit more detail, so uh, re related to urban networks, we um, initially we can um, load an existing urban network into the map view and also into a tabular view um, to view the content of the urban network and view it in a, a, a map um, scenario with uh, any base mapping, um, any other GIS data sets, and also in conjunction with any existing 1D river networks. 
we can then also access the uh, underlying data within that urban network and review the uh, properties of any nodes or links that make up that network and not only review we can also edit those properties make changes um, and then save those changes back to create either uh, a revised version of that network or save it as to a new network file and it's not only the the nodes and link properties that we can edit within the the urban network we can also access more global settings um, such as the sort of standard ones such as the uh, start and end times and time steps and we can edit those and then we can also look at some more of the the climatology settings such as um, uh, evaporation temperature and that sort of data and we can edit those uh, properties of the network and again we can save those changes back to either create a, a new version of the, the network or save save them to the existing file and once you've made all those changes and you're happy with the, the urban network you can also run these simulations within the flood model environment and our urban solver simulations will display the same sort of progress window that you'll already be used to from running 1D river and 2D simulations within flood modeler so we, we um, display a, a sort of live um, updating um, summary of the model so far uh, both in terms of chart form to um, um, plot in some of the key features of that uh, simulation such as such as system volumes and also some of the uh, key diagnostic information and, and um, summary information from that model is also displayed live during the simulation once the simulation is completed um, we've we've developed a, a range of new plotting tools uh, designed specifically for accessing and reviewing the results from our urban simulations so we can look at uh, uh, any combination of time series of with data taken from either nodes or links within the urban network we can also plot uh, long sections and we can plot uh, different variables against each other that have been produced from the urban networks in a XY scatter format. Um, all of these plots are fully customizable, so you can change the which node you're looking at, the, the start and end range for your long sections, etc. You can also change the look and feel of the charts. Um, there's a full suite of, of editing tools for them. And then you can export that data for either as an image to place into a report or export the underlying data. Uh, in CSV format so you can edit further within um, packages such as Excel. So that provides a uh, summary of the urban related features that we've introduced in Flood Modeler version 5. I'm now going to sort of take the risk of going into a, a live demo and show you these, uh, these features actually in action. So I'm now switching to the, the flood modeler interface, which I've already opened. And before I start, I'm just going to go give you a summary of the, some of the new features within the interface that have come in um, related to the urban solver. So first of all, starting in with the, the main toolbar ribbon at the top, you can see there are some new controls in the home tab, but also there's a dedicated one, the urban build tab where all of our urban solver related functionality is, is uh, stored. So we have the uh, facility to load our networks. We also have um, tools for linking dynamically to our 1D river and 2D um, uh, models as well, um, and uh, sort of controls for uh, customising what we show on the map view. Um, in the left-hand panel, we have the project panel. We have a new subsection entitled 1D Urban Networks. So when we load our 1D Urban Networks into the map view they'll appear in this area here and they also actually appear in simulations as well um, the reason for that is because the the 1d urban files um, or that represent the model it's all stored in a single model file a text file with a .imp extension and that file contains both the content of the model in terms of its nodes and links but also the run details in terms of its start time end time and other simulation settings so because it's all stored in one file it appears both in the urban network section and in the simulations when we load it in which i'll do so in due course over on the right hand panel where we have the familiar sort of 1d river network table we also have a new tab for urban models and this is where we store the tabular version of the network so we have two sub tabs one links one nodes and these two tables store all nodes and links that make up our urban network so i better go ahead and actually load one so you can see what i mean so 
if I go to the load network button, I can pick my IMP file, hit open, wait a few seconds. And as you can see, it's loaded it in and we have a new suite of icons to represent the different node and link types within um, uh, the Wandy Urban Solver. So if I put on our labels here, you can see that we have um, what these are called junction nodes, so effectively manholes. We also have uh, subcatchments, which are listed within the nodes table as well. Um, and these are represented both by an icon and then also a polygon that represents the extent of that subcatchment. And we have links, which are just represented by uh, single lines that uh, represent that, and they are obviously representing the pipes that join up between these different manholes. Now, if I want to look at um, the underlying sort of area that this, this network exists in, I can turn on my base maps and then you'll get a, a sort of more realistic representation of where this model exists. And obviously I can zoom in, zoom around and see exactly where each manhole is located. Now, if I want to access the properties of a particular node, I just need to highlight it like I'm doing here and then right click and select the node properties. And you'll see these prop pop up in a new pop-up window. And these are all the sort of core properties of that node. But a lot of the nodes have um, sub properties that are of data sets related to that particular node, such as time series. So if that's the case, we can access those as well. So in this case, there's a, a, a direct flow uh, time series that we can look at. And if you want to look at the underlying data, Again, I can access that in a new window and I can make changes to this and then save those changes. And if I want to look at what the impact of those changes are, I can actually plot the data as well. So all of this information is available from, our, from the existing network that I've loaded in. Similarly, if I want to look at a, a link property, I look at the highlighted link and I can, do, uh, I can do this from inside the map. I can also do it from inside the, the right hand table as well. Choose the link properties. And again, sometimes there are subsets of, uh, of variables that are uh, related to these links, and I can access those in additional pop-up windows, such as this shape of the uh, pipe. So that's the individual node and link properties. If I um, want to look at the more sort of global properties of that network, I would go over to my project panel, highlight the uh, urban network in there, right click and you can see I can access model settings and so this shows me all the sort of core global settings such as the start and end date I'm going to run the model for, what the time step is and then also the climatology data is available from uh, uh, the right click menu in the project panel and that shows me things like temperature, evaporation, snow melt and I can make lots of changes not necessarily um, that much to change for, regarding snow melt for this model. Anyway, once I've made any changes I uh, I want to make, I can proceed to uh, to run this simulation, and I can either do that by highlighting it in the simulation section, and then the right click option has to run, or I can just go to my simulation tab in the top ribbon and choose run. And as you can see, we get the same sort of progress window as we'd usually get for a um, 1D river network or 2D model and we get the same sort of summary uh, diagnostic information listed here in a table and more detail is available on the output tab which I seem to, there we go, um, like that and then also we have the option of plotting some different plot data up here. So there's a, set, a range of different plot information provided. And once the simulation is completed and we've got the green bar over there, I can shut that down and I now have some results available. So how do I look at those results? Well, if I want to look at some time series, I can highlight a number of nodes and links as like so. And then I can right click and choose my time series tool and this is the new time series tools dedicated to 1D urban results. 
and you can see it's made up of a, a list of all the uh, available nodes and links so I can further customize my selection if I want to before going ahead to plot um, as you can see I've got a range of different uh, links or pipes already selected and I've also got a range of uh, nodes. So these are all junction nodes, so they're effectively manholes, and they're already selected as well. I've got my results file for my currently active network automatically added here, but if I had some other results I want to compare against, I could load those in as well. I have a list of available variables from the simulation, and by default, the tool picks up the depth of water within the manhole or node depth, and it also picks up the flow through a particular pipe the link flow as a default but I could equally I could change that to anything I wanted and it plot the plot time range defaults to the full range of that simulation as you can see it was a very quick simulation so it, um, it's just a, a 12 hours of data but I could if I had a longer simulation and I want to look at a subset I could change the values in these controls in order to set exactly what period I wanted to plot once I'm happy with all of that I hit the plot button and as you can see, there's a whole host of uh, lines on there because I selected quite a few different nodes. And that's sort of showing me the range of, of depths in each of the manholes that I selected um, going through the period of the simulation. And I've also got a range of flows and the flow data is on the, the right hand axis at axes um, uh, for me to read over. If I want to read more accurately values in a particular place along the, uh, these charts, I can actually put what's called the uh, the cursor values on just by ticking this box and now you can see some crosshairs hopefully on this chart and as I move across where the vertical line is crossing any of my plots it is giving me the value at that location so I can read off and just inspect values in a bit more detail and just reading them across manually on the chart itself And obviously I can turn that back off if I wanted. I can turn on or off any of the uh, particular um, series to further customize. But equally, I can return back to the window to edit further if I wanted to. And if I wanted to uh, edit the look and feel of the chart, I can use the edit chart series button to access a whole host of customization options uh, to change the look and feel of this chart. And once I'm happy with it, I can export that either as an image or under, export the underlying data to take into um, something like Excel. So that's time series, um, but there's not, it's not only time series we can do. I can, I can also um, highlight uh, a range of, of the nodes within the network and create a long section through there. So I could just highlight on the here, on the, the right hand table, but I can also use the, the more um, detailed sort of polygon select tool it's also available for river networks to select a subset of my network like so once I've got that selection I have the option to do a long section and as you can see the long section highlights exactly where all the junction nodes or manholes are within the within the uh, network that I've selected and also shows me the ground levels as well and the good thing about this uh, chart is I can also animate the, the uh, model simulation within this and show, show hopefully the pipes filling up. So if I just press play, I can change the speed a bit and hopefully you can see there that gradually through the course of this simulation, water levels increase at different locations. In actual fact, it's showing that some flooding here. So this is a suggestion that maybe I need a, an integrated model to try and model this effect. And this effect um, on and where the water is going to go once it reaches the surface. So it's suggesting maybe I need to connect this dynamically with a 2D model and model that as an integrated system. If I want to change the selection that I've I've plotted, I can change my start and end node from within here without going back to, to the map again. And the tool will automatically calculate the route from whatever start and end node I select and create a long section from that. So that's uh, plotting results from our, my urban network. And effectively that sort of ends that first demonstration. So um, if I want to uh, go back to my um, presentation, move on to the next section. And I want to talk a little bit now about integrated modeling. So I've obviously mentioned during 
that demo how we can link dynamically with our 1D river and uh, 2D solvers. And that enables us to do things like connect a urban network outfall to a river where it might be spilling into the river and then model the exchange that might happen between that outfall and the river flows. We also could um, connect any flooding manholes to a 2D domain and model the exchange of water between the, the, the surface 2D domain and the, the urban network and look at the spread of that um, flooding flow across the, the 2D domain. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail in this presentation because of time constraints and um, on how we go about dynamically linking these systems together. But I do want to raise the, your attention to a future webinar coming up very soon, which is going to focus primarily on this integrated catchment modeling process and how to do it within flood modeler version five. Uh, this slide in, in, um, includes a, a QR code there for you to scan if you want to register automatically for that webinar. So moving on from urban networks, I want to talk to you now about um, 1D embedded structures within the 2D domain. So what do we mean by this? What's the problem? Well, quite often we might have within the 2D domain certain flow routes, such as conduits uh, under road embankments, that sort of thing, which we want to model um, accurately um, using, say, some 1D components. It's like very similar to like a, a river uh, type flow mechanism. However, uh, to date, in order to do this, we've had to do it by dynamically linking our a 1D river network that contains the suitable components, such as conduit nodes, conduit inlets, etc., cetera, um, and dynamically connect that to our 2D model. And although it's possible and you can get good results from it, it's quite a complex process that takes a bit of time to set up in order to get uh, to ensure that the model is going to run with um, a degree of stability. Uh, main problem is, is that 1D river networks like the their components to stay wet at all times. And it's not always possible if the, the uh, um, conduit is embedded somewhere away from a, 1D, uh, a river network on a 2D domain detached from um, the uh, any sort of constant flow and it's only going to get wet when it's flooded so to try and um, make this process a lot simpler and a lot easier um, we've in introduced this embedded structures functionality within our 2d solver so all of the calculations for this structure are carried out within the 2d solver itself no need to link to a full 1d river network in order to to, to model this effect obviously you can still have your 1d river network linked dynamically to, a, to your 2D model in this same integrated system, but the 1D river will be just focusing on the actual river processes and not act, uh, modeling these embedded structures separately. So what have we actually done? So we've enabled this very simple process where you effectively just need to draw a line on your uh, map view to show where you want your embedded structure to start and finish. Um, you draw it using a particular tool that I'm going to go on to show you so shortly, and then you associate um, properties of your structure to this line. Um, we've made the, um, the structures, certain structures compatible with this system, and they are the most commonly used ones, we think, for um, embedded structures on the floodplain, and they are culverts, orifice, and weir units. And You'll, have, you'll see um, familiarity with these, these units within the embedded structure system because we've actually reused the same um, options that are already available in full 1D river networks. So you can model any of the culvert shape options that you might uh, uh, encounter. So that could be uh, rectangular, circular, archway, asymmetric, symmetric. You can model a, a whole range of different weir types as well. Um, as well as that is obviously an orifice option for for doing a more simplified um, embedded structure so once you've drawn your line you then have to access a new structures wizard tool which takes you through the process of defining the properties of your structure and included within that because we're using all of the the full sort of 1d culvert options available you can also introduce the um the options that are uh, embedded within 1d river solver um, uh, provided by Syria uh, in the Culv Culvert Design and Operation Guide to, to sort of define the properties of your inlets correctly and to conform to that Syria guide. 
Okay, so that's enough of me talking about it. I want to actually show you this. So I'm going to switch back to the modeler. I'm going to just um, simplify my view, start a new project. So there's a project I've repaired earlier. This is just a simple to, it's, it's set up for a simple 2D model. As you can see, I've got the underlying DTM loaded. And I mean, I could put some satellite mapping on as well if I wanted, just to show, give it some context. But um, my orange area is, is going to be a 2D domain that I want to model using the 2D solver. And if I zoom in on a particular area, down here, hopefully the, you can see from the DTM that there is a raised embankment. Now, what I want to do is model, if I wanted to model some culverts passing underneath this embankment to enable the flow to traverse from this upper area to the lower area, once the water enters the floodplain, I would go to the 2D build tab now, and I can see there's a new icon called 1D structures. And that tool, when accessing, prompts me for a, a name for my, um, shapefile is going to represent the lines that um, show the, the, the uh, locations of all my culverts. And I'm going to call it my culvert and save that. And now we, we access the layer editor tool that's standard for any sort of shapefile editing within Flood Modeler. And I can use the line function to say I want to my culvert to traverse from here to here. And obviously I could draw more lines to represent more culverts. I could also maybe zoom in a bit closer to get the position of this more accurate, but this is just for, it's for demonstration purposes. I think this is, this is sufficient. So now I've drawn my line, I can access the 1D um, edit structures tool, which is included in the layer editor, just for this type of line. And you can see a new window pops up. It's only got one row in it because I've only got one line drawn. And it's completely blank at the moment because I've not defined any properties. I can call it anything I want. So I'm going to call it again, my culvert 01, I'm going to call it. Now the next field to, to edit is the structure type. And this pops up a window giving me my options. So I can choose a culvert, I can choose a weir, choose an orifice. If I choose a weir, I've got down here a whole host of different weir types I could choose. If I choose a culvert, I have the option of adding a bend. So that's assuming that, the, that the, um, the culvert has a bend in it somewhere. Effectively, it's modeling an additional energy loss. So if you want to include this additional energy loss, you can click include river uh, culvert bend and specify it as a, as a bend in the culvert. It doesn't have to appear in your actual line. Your line can just, is just marking the start and end position of where it's going to interact with the 2D domain. I can also choose a range of different uh, culvert types. I'm going to stick with the default, which is rectangular, and hit OK. And you can see here now the node labels are handled automatically. You don't have to worry about those. The type is set to culvert, subtype rectangular. We have a length field, which I'll come back to shortly. We have the bend, which is not included, so it's not set. Uh, an invert change, again, I'll come back to that shortly. And then this right hand column is showing. Uh, a couple of new icons now, and you'll recognize these from your 1D river networks. We have a culvert inlet, which we can define. And as I said, we can access the uh, the data associated to the culvert design and operation guide provided by Syria by hitting the run culvert wizard. This gives me a whole range of different inlet types. I'm going to choose rectangular. There's only one material for that, but some of the other options have multiple materials to choose from. And there's a whole host of different in uh, shapes that you can choose. Um, again, I'm just going to stick with the default, and that produces a looks up uh, a database to see wh what set of uh, variables that comfort that combination um, relates to. And if I hit finish, all those variables are populated in the relevant fields, and I can just hit OK, and that culvert is designed is is then in, culvert inlet is then defined. I can then move on to look at the the culvert um, section, which is rectangular. Again, a few of the fields are, are grayed out because they're automatically set. Um, we can just set the elevation at the inlet. I'm going to put that to 10 meters, give it a two meter width, one meter height, put some 
roughness variables in, and then hit OK. And effectively, I've defined then my culvert section, and that inlet and section will be repeated at either end. So it basically forms a single reach with an upstream and downstream cross section defined by that section I've just defined, um, and an inlet at both ends because we don't know which way, which direction the flow is going to go through. So we have the same inlet at either end. It can go, and, a, and the flow can reverse through or go through forwards. Doesn't mind, and that's all defined. Um, the length field is set to zero by default. If I leave it at zero, it means the solver was going to look at the length of the line I've drawn and say that's the length of my culvert. If I want my um, a, a more precise measurement of length of culvert, I could enter in here, say, 25.8 meters, and have that as the length of culvert. And then if that value is anything other than zero, um, this length will override the length of the line. So I can keep that in there. If I was then to proceed and hit OK to save, you'll see I get, it gets me a warning message because at the moment I've left invert change as zero. So what it's saying is currently that culvert is completely flat and horizontal. Now I could leave it as flat, but in actual fact, I'm going to put a small drop on it of um, uh, 0.2 meters. So that's my culvert data saved and it actually saves to a separate um, text file associated to the um, shapefile um, with a .str extension. So you can go and look at that, but I wouldn't recommend making any edits to it because that's what this tool is for here. I can then save my shapefile, stop editing. So how, now I've saved that structures file, how do I incorporate it into my 2D model? Well, I have a 2D model already loaded here in this project. And hopefully you'll be familiar with this interface for specifying the 2D data. And on the domains tab, we have a new sub tab entitled 1D structures. And if I go onto there, you can see a blank table. What I need to do is to add this structure to my 2D model, which is pick it up from the layers panel and just drop it in. And when that happens, I get a little pop up, which sort of says, this is the data you've, you've tried to add. Is this correct? Well, yes, that's that's, um, just give me a, a, a view of the attributes in my shapefile. That's the one I wanted to add. And what variables do you want to produce when you do run a simulation? And there's a default set, but I can add others by just ticking the relevant boxes. It's going to use a save interval of 300 seconds, which is picked up from the main 2D model and just repeated. That's what it, the 2D model is using, so it's just going to use that. Um, and also, it's going to use the main 2D runtime. So if my simulation is from 0 to 12 hours, it's going to record data for the culvert, not 12 hours. But if I know it doesn't get wet to six hours, then I could change to bespoke timings and actually only record data from six hours through to 12 hours. Um, so that option is also available. I'm happy, click OK, and it's added it in there. And I have the option then of adding further uh, embedded structures to this table, and they'll all be added to the model. And these are all independent from any linking that we have to a Wandy River network. That's specified obviously separately within the 2D model setup. Um, and so I can either have a whole set of shapefiles that each with individual embedded structures within them, or I could add more structures to that shapefile. The choice is, is yours, really. You can have multiple features within the same shapefile. I'm not going to run that now because that takes a little while, but really, hopefully, that shows you the, um, the process of embedding these structures and how easy it is now. So returning to the presentation, um, that's uh, embedded structures and what I wanted to say about that. I'm going to move on now and just talk a little bit about um, uh, levees and incorporating those into 1D river sections. So what problem are we trying to solve here? Well, the fact that uh, a 1D model by definition will calculate a single constant water level and apply this across the entire cross section. So a lot of the time this is absolutely fine and um, it's not, not going to be an issue. But in some um, scenarios, you might have quite high banks with low line areas beyond it, i.e. levees, um, and in that situation, um, as the water level rises up, you're going to show the area beyond the high bank getting wet before the water's actually exceeded that bank height, because it's just drawing a, a, a single horizontal water level across that whole cross section. And that might misrepresent how how the um, that, that uh, section is behaving at that point in the flood and it might not be a critical point in the flood in 
uh, that you're modeling so it might not be a problem but if it is something you want to take account of now you can add these levee markers that we've introduced so these are separate uh, markers added to the the bank point high points or wherever you actually want to add them uh, to each river section and then once you've added these it tells the river uh, 1d river solver to calculate separate water levels on either side of these um, uh, markers uh, separate from the main in-bank flow that it already will be calculated and hopefully this allows you to give a, to provide a more realistic representation of water levels across the entire section now I'm not going to do a live demo of this I'm, I'm just going to show you um, on a on a through a, a, few, a screenshot how this what we mean by this so this top right image is what we currently ha would have in a traditional 1d river cross section and you can see as the water level has risen up we've got a constant water level going all the way across and showing this area here is wet when in actual fact it might not have had the opportunity to get wet yet because it would need to exceed this bank high point so what you need to do if you want to take this um, to, to model this more accurately or more realistically i should say um, is add uh, one of the new special markers so we've got a right levee and left levee option that are accessed in this special marker column for each river section you just click on the little ellipsis button there and you get the list of special markers and put right or left in there and what will happen is when you actually rerun that simulation if you've got a levee marker added here you can see this area is staying dry as this area gets wet as the flood increases and goes over the top of that point then you'll start getting a separate water level here that is different from this level water level here and as the flood increases further these two levels would equal out equalize out and then as they drop back down as the water level comes back down below this level it would again show a slight disparity in, in levels and a more realistic representation of um, the uh, levels across that entire section and as you can see from this right hand image we've actually um, um, enhanced the cross-section plotting tool to enable the these different water levels to be displayed um, all together on the same plot and not only that you can animate these plots so you see the rise and fall of levels in all three zones or in two zones in this particular example um, uh, within that animation so that's the three sort of detailed sort of um, enhancements I wanted to talk about um, with, uh, today but also I just want to touch upon a few of the other efficiency enhancements that we've implemented within version 5. So we've uh, done some work to improve our handling of large 2D result sets because as we see results getting larger and larger over the recent years um, we need to really sort of be able to handle those a lot quicker so um, now you can move but once you've loaded your 2D results into Flood Modeler you'll see a much quicker performance but as you move between the different time steps uh, to visualize the onset and um, uh, uh, reduction of flooding within a particular model scenario we've also enhanced the river section marker editing tool primarily this was to address the the, the addition of these new levee markers to now you, allow you to automatically select a group of cross sections and say change all bank markers there to levee markers in one operation to do to make that a much quicker process than going into each cross section individually um, but we've done more than that we've we've made that tool a lot more flexible so you can also do a lot more in terms of changing markers to deactivation markers and changing deactivation markers back to bank markers or to levee markers so you can do a lot more sort of um, variations combinations of marker changing um, on a groups of um, selected river sections and really sort of speed up your editing of that 1D river network. Furthermore, you can also globally adjust um, river section bed elevations. So you can select multiple river sections again and choose to adjust uh, elevations up or down, primarily for doing sort of sensitivity analysis to see the effects of dredging or siltation um, within your um, river network. We've improved a lot of the diagnostics and error messaging to try and give clearer messages and more messages so that when you do encounter an issue when you're building a model, hopefully the, the message you're getting is going to give you a clear indication of what's needed to fix the problem um, quickly and easily. And we've done much more, more than that. We, you know, we, we've been adding lots and lots of different enhancements and a lot of these are detailed within 
the release notes. We've done uh, also lots of uh, the bug fixes. We've tried to listen to what um, our clients have been telling us through the support network as well and try and implement some of the suggestions that, that have come in through that medium as well. So we really sort of um, enhanced the software greatly in version five. Um, as Alistair said earlier on, there's well over 30 individual enhancements and not to mention all the other little bug fixes and tweaks we've done along the way to really make this software a, a big a step forward from the previous version. But we're not stopping there, we're doing lots more work um, to, in the near future to add new features and I'm going to hand back to Alistair now to give a, a quick summary of what's coming soon. Thanks Bob, that was uh, an excellent introduction to uh, some of the new features within Flood Modeler uh, version 5. Um, I do now have the opportunity to, to share a few of the things we're already working on uh, which will be included within future releases of the software including 5.1, which is due for release um, early next year. Uh, so first on this list is the, the full 1D urban build capability. So as Bob mentioned earlier, uh, you can currently load, edit, run, and view uh, your 1D urban models, uh, as well as link these to the 1D river and 2D solvers within Flood Modeler. However, you can't currently build these models from scratch. Uh, as we're keen to accelerate the release of uh, version five, these capabilities didn't quite uh, make it into this release, but they will be present in 5.1, which will be early next year. Uh, next on the list is the, the Flood Modeler 2D GPU solver, which will enable you to uh, accelerate your simulations using GPU technology. Uh, and this will also be available as part of 5.1. Other features include uh, a new flexible mesh solver, uh, 2D flexible mesh, mesh solver, which allows more efficient modeling, particularly within uh, urban areas. We're working on new data ma management capabilities uh, to aid version control and, and help you share your data more effectively. And we're also developing new hydrological boundaries for the FSU and RFH 2.3 methods. Um, and these will also be present in, in, in 5.1. As, as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, a number of webinars which will uh, cover some of the features that Bob just uh, discussed or introduced earlier today uh, and you can register for all of these at floodmodeler.com forward slash webinars. Um, so before we move on to the, the Q&A session, um, I just wanted to quickly summarise uh, today's presentation. Um, Bob, if you can quickly jump to the next slides. Um, so Flood Modeler 5 will be released uh, and available on our website in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the three of the key features within version five include the, the new 1D Urban Solver, which enables you to undertake integrated catchment modeling, uh, the ability to embed 1D structures directly within your, your 2D domain, as well as the new levy capabilities to realistically represent uh, water levels for your entire river section. The software does also provide over 30 other updates, which, which enhance your flood modeler experience, such as improved diagnostics and, and error messaging. And finally, lots of the, the other features um, are already in development, such as GPU, uh, new hydrological boundaries. Uh, some of these will be available from as early as next year. And all of these features introduced today, uh, and many of these that are in development, all intend to improve your understanding of flood risk, uh, accelerate your model development, enhance your modeling experience, and help you solve your modeling problems. So on that note, we'll move on to the, the Q&A parts of today's webinar, where we hope to answer as many of your questions as possible. Uh, if we don't get a chance to respond uh, during this session, we'll also follow up with you directly by email. Um, before we make a start, I'll quickly introduce the panel. We have Conrad Adams and Rob Honeywell joining Bob, uh, who are both senior developers of Flood Modeler and have brought many of the features discussed today uh, to version 5. Uh, if you'd like to unmute your, your, your lines um, so you can help answer some of these questions, that'd be great. Um, so I'll kick off and ask a, a couple of questions. We've had many submitted in advance uh, at registration, but we've also had a number come through during today's webinar, so we will work through as many as possible. Um, the first one for you, Bob, um, was just touching on, uh, I mean, you'll be going into more detail at your next webinar, but it's the integrated modeling. Uh, you mentioned you could link the, the 1D urban solver to Flood Modeler's existing solvers, but somebody's asked whether you can link the 1D river solver, the 1D urban solver, and the 2D solver together in a single model? Uh, yes, you, you can link all three. You can actually, you can link, it's actually almost like a triangular sort of set of linking. You, you can link your 1D river to 1D urban, 
you can link your 2D solver to 1D urban. You can link your, and in the same model, your 2D solver can be linked to your 1D river. So you've got everything exchanging and interacting dynamically within a single integrated simulation. Excellent. And as, Thank I said, you. as I said before as well, um, I'll cover how you go about setting that sort of linking up in the, the forthcoming webinar. Great, thank you. Um, link, link to the 1D Urban Solver, there's quite a few, a few on this feature. Um, we, we, we've been asked, how does it compare uh, with other solutions uh, in terms of accuracy and speeds? Is there anything you can provide on that? Well, the, the 1D Urban Solver builds on over 40 years of uh, development and application uh, of the US EPA SWIM model. So it's, it's proven to be a fast, accurate solution. Um, we've been undertaking some benchmarking exercises as well to confirm this, and it's shown that uh, Wandy Urban is comparable with alternative software solutions. And in some cases, it can prove to be significantly faster as well. Um, I think uh, yourself, Alistair, your, your, your team will be sharing some of this information as well in the coming weeks. We'll be, we'll be putting that out there, the results of this, this benchmarking. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that'll be shared in coming weeks. Um, we have uh, we had another question uh, this this time um, in in response to the the speed improvements uh, of the the flood model interface um, and somebody's asked uh, what what speed improvements can I expect uh, when loading large two D result sets um, I think this is probably one for you Rob um, as yeah. developer of the interface yeah sure um, so there's a couple of components to it so when you load in two D results there's the time taken for the initial loading of the results file. And there's the time taken to move between the time steps when viewing the results. Um, so the gains do depend on you know the file type, uh, you know XMDF, SMS, and the size. Um, but in general, the initial loading has been halved, just to as a as a rough um, rough figure. Uh, and the stepping through the time steps, which was the main issue, to be honest. Um, has been sped up by up to 11 times so quite quite a significant amount excellent thank you um conrad um i don't know if you've unmuted but hopefully you're, you're still on the line but we have something around embedding embedded structures uh, i think you have been muted now excellent um so embedded structures um i had a question uh is it still okay to continue embedding structures in the old way uh, and build a full 1d network or would you recommend um, only using the embedded structures or the automated embedded structures in version five going forward? What's what's the best approach? Um, there? Well, we haven't changed the way in which the uh, 1D river and um, and I guess now 1D urban is, is, is another alternative now that you could have, but we haven't changed the way in which 1D river and, and um, 2D uh, link together. So your old models will be valid um the the idea with having it in integrated into the uh in into the 2d uh solver is is purely one for ease of model building that you don't have to um want a better word mess around with two separate models and to and to link the two together but there are some occasions where you might want where where the um where the 1d river element on its own uh, would be advantageous um the one obvious thing that springs to mind is uh, when you have a structure with uh, operational rules, those are not uh, implemented in, in, the, uh, in, in the 2D or the 1D embedded units in the 2D solver, whatever we're calling it. Um, so anything with operational rules um, and sluice gates, pumps, that sort of thing would uh, need to be done with, uh, with, a, with a separate 1D model as you would currently do. But to, to my mind, um, if it's a simple um, culvert, orifice, or even something behaves like a weir in the middle of your 2D, uh, 2D area, then um, yeah, I'd, I'd go for the new for the new option. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, we have uh, linked to the embedded structures. We have a, a question uh, around editing uh, editing the, the, the structure. Um, so perhaps one for you, Rob, um, the interface. Um, it, we've been asked, can I edit the embedded structure data file uh, in the standard user interface, or do I have to use the embedded structures editor? 
Uh, okay, yeah, so whilst technically you can edit the data file in the normal waves and the normal editor, I, I think we'd recommend that you don't. Um, and the reason for that is that um, we've put a lot of work in behind the scenes to ensure that that file, uh, the data consistency and the accuracy of the model is correct. Um, so we're doing things behind the scenes to make sure all the node labels and things like that are, are all set up correctly so you don't have to worry about it. And so the nice thing is that that manages all of that for you and the layout of the file. Um, you don't have to worry about what the node labels are. Um, if, if you specify a change in invert level, um, say for a symmetrical conduit, it will, it will um, do that for you and adjust the downstream uh, conduit will be uh, the, the symmetrical conduit will have all the sort of values subtracted for you, save you having to do it manually. So there's things like that they will do for you. So I would strongly recommend that you use the embedded structures editor. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've had quite a few more questions around 1D Urban, so I'll come back to you uh, now, Bob, if that's okay. Um, we've got a question here um, asking whether the whether can the 1D Urban solver load InfoWorks uh, ICM models do we have an answer for that? Well, and not the direct sort of format, but the InfoWorks itself has an export function where you can export the data to a, a format that is compatible with 1D Urban. So, so the the answer the, the answer really is yes, you can can load the data, but you have to perform a an export operation first to, to do that. But once you've done that, yes, you can bring the data in as a 1D Urban network, and then you can get to work dynamically linking it with other sub model components. Great. Thank you. Um, Bob, um, on the coming soon slide, which I mentioned, but perhaps you're best to, to answer this, um, I, I, I mentioned the addition of uh, RFH 2.3. Um, can you confirm when this will be added uh, and whether it will be uh, included or whether it oh, includes yes, additional um, output options? Obviously, RFH 2.3 is provided not, not by ourselves. It's, it's a, a third party software provided by um, Wallingford Hydro Solutions. Um, they actually, their release of the 2.3 component that we we utilize embedded within for modeler um just missed the deadline really for us to be able to include it in 5.0 so we'll be working hard to get that into 5.1 um so that'll be available and once it's in there all of the 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 um, functionality that is provided by that um update 2.3 update will be um incorporated within to our into our revised rfh2 um hydro a hydrological boundary unit within um, the Wandi River suite of um, boundary types. Thank you. Great. Um, Conrad, um, possibly one for you, but feel free to for others to jump in. Um, something on uh, the yeah. levy functionality. Um, could you provide uh, a bit more information on this? Uh, are there any reasons why you wouldn't want to use the levy markers? Uh, so, was the first question any more information on? Is that how it how it works or yeah if you could give an overview yeah, yeah. um uh, you know what what it is why you use okay, it so, and why you wouldn't um so i'll i'll start with possibly the easiest this this the uh, second part of the question first why would you use it why wouldn't you use it um i guess if your uh, if your floodplain is not is either above your your bank um so it's sloping upwards i guess away from the river or very slightly below so it wouldn't make any hydraulic dis difference um then you're obviously taking time to input your levee markers for no uh for no additional benefit and also there's a bit of increased computational times because it's got to process effectively three or up to three components of the river section separately rather than the, rather than the one um the one on its own uh, as it does currently Obviously, the, the the benefit is when you do have these kind of perch channels or your low-lying um, washlandy type uh, um, sections. If you're if if indeed you're you're modelling it in one D, and there should be increased reason to do so. How how it works is um, almost alluded to it further. It, it kind of compartmentalises the uh, river section properties into three into three components. So you've got the inbank portion, the left flood plane, and the right flood plane. Uh, flood portion and it's what it essentially does is have a lookup table between um, depths or height water levels and and the cross-section properties as it does in the moment but you know it's just a single value at the moment so when it's in bank 
the uh, when the water level is below the uh, below the levee marker, then it's just the bank portion. When it's just above the levee marker, then there's a uh, a different lookup table that um, incorporates the areas conveyances in the floodplain. And then when it's significantly above the levee uh, marker, I don't know if I'm explaining this very well, but it, that the um, the, the default is one meter. When, if it gets to, let's call it one meter at the moment, it's a user editable um, feature. But when it gets to one meter above the levee um, elevation, then everything equalizes out and the entire cross section behaves like it does currently. So it's, I, I guess, between that first and third stage is, is where the transition occurs. So we have, have kind of like a, a smooth transition of properties between the two. And then on the recession, it doesn't quite work in reverse to that because it doesn't, because um, you obviously don't want water jumping back back across the bank marker when, um, so if you can imagine it sort of wearing over the top, it won't do a sort of reverse wear um, when it gets below below the bank marker, it kind of falls at a constant rate uh, on, on the recession. So it is, um, yeah, slightly more, um, Involved than the, uh, the, the, the the current method, but obviously more uh, more realistic. Hope that's uh, hope that encapsulated it <laughs> enough. I mean, we can provide more de details later as as and when needed. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, we do uh, we have we have quite a few coming in still. Um, um, back to the, I presume it's the one the urban. Um, somebody's asked, can the new combined method be exported in a mapping format as per the, the create 1D, 2D flood map option. Uh, is that one for you, Bob? Uh, yeah, and, and I'd say um, it's, it's possible to do a combined uh, map, but it's one of the things we're actually going to be working on in the near future, I think, to, to, to generate a, a fully integrated output to sort of link those different map components together. Um, but it is possible to to generate uh, a flood map that incorporates 1D and 2D elements at the moment. It just involves some careful um, preparation with the, the generation of a, a tin for the 1D data. Okay, thank you. Um, another question on, on 1D urban. So when you loaded your 1D urban model, uh, you loaded uh, an INP file. Um, how, how do you create this type of file? Um, well, currently, uh, that one the, the options would be uh, the one we've already mentioned, which is the export from InfoWorks. Another option, though, would be to use uh, some of the well, the, the EPA-related softwares, so the EPA Swim interface. However, in the very near future, i.e. 5.1, that process will all be brought in. That will be what we'll be adding into um into the flood modeler main interface as well so you'll be able to do everything within flood modeler in the very near future um great great yep thank you um again on your on your 1d urban demo um you showed how to produce a long section plot uh which represented i think it was manholes and ground levels um somebody's asked can you also see the maximum water levels um i don't think that's available on uh, um on the urban plots, you can obviously get uh, maximum water levels are available on any 1D river plots, um, but that's a, a that's a good, a, a good idea that I'll take on board and maybe incorporate into our, our future development list, I think, because I think that would be a, a good feature to, to add. Um, I'm not sure uh, if, if um, Conrad wants want to comment on that at all, if it, it, just to confirm that it's not currently available as an, as an output. I, I don't think it is by default. Um... What uh, uh, I guess there's three options. One is is to animate the long section uh, plot, and I mean all three of them are a bit bit of a manual uh, process at the moment. But if you animate the long section plot, then you can see from that. Uh, you could do a time series plot at each individual location, which yeah, it will give you the answer, but you know involve a bit of stepping through. And I guess the other thing to do would be to look at the um, Look at the report file that's produced, which does output the the, the maximum. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, 
know, while you're writing that, while you were saying that, comrade, I was writing it down as a, a <clears> thing <throat> to add to our list of um, future development because I think to make that more that sort of information more accessible would be a, a good a good idea to, for us to add. So, thank you for whoever asked that question. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, we are on the hour, um, possibly time for just one more, which I can probably answer. Um, we've been asked whether we, whether, or whether they can download, whether you can download Flub Modeler 5 for free. Uh, so Flub for customers with a, a valid support maintenance contract, yes, you, you can download Flub Modeler uh, version 5 directly from our website in the next couple of weeks and, and use it immediately. Uh, for those who don't currently have a contract, um, please get in touch. We'd be happy to discuss uh, your requirements and, and provide various options. Um, so on, on that, um, I'll draw the webinar to a close. Thank you to Bob for, for delivering <laughs> particularly the live demos. Um, but for any questions we didn't get a chance to answer, we will respond to you directly by email. Um, the, the recording and the questions will also be circulated in the next couple of days. Uh, thank you for your time and um, hopefully hear from you soon.